Chapter 2. Pivot from Excuses. Make hay while the sun shines. My first job was at McDonald's, making the minimum wage of $5.75 an hour in early 2006. I used to feel envious of my friend who worked at the gas station because he made $7 an hour, and I had another buddy who worked at Lowe's for $9 an hour. The thought of ever making $20 plus an hour was mind-blowing to my 17-year-old brain. I have always been extremely money-motivated. On top of working at McDonald's during my senior year, I also mowed lawns and built furniture in shop class to sell to my family and friends. My mission was to save up enough money to move out to Los Angeles. By June 2006, fresh out of high school, I took the $5,000 I had saved, plus a nice chunk of graduation gift money, and drove out to LA. I quickly realized my $5,000 was only going to last a few months, and that was even sharing my one-bedroom apartment with a roommate. After a month of watching my hard-earned money dwindle, I knew I had to get a job. I started as a food runner, then as a dog sitter, followed by landing a gig as a representative at AAA. As it turned out, these jobs were not a great fit for me, so I quit. It was after leaving AAA that I found a job at American Eagle. Working there kept a roof over my head and food in my belly while I auditioned. Just as it had been when I was 17, while working at the clothing store for $8 an hour, I saw my friends earning more money hosting and serving tables, and I wanted in. After a year and a half at American Eagle, I got hired at the Outback Steakhouse as a host for $14 an hour, which included the tip share. After a year of hosting, I got promoted to server, where I made $25 an hour. It was unbelievable. As the savings account began to slowly grow, I landed my first national commercial spot for Taco Bell. It played repeatedly, and I got my first real taste of Hollywood money. Due to my upbringing, I was taught not to get fancy and to save my money for a rainy day, or, as my dad always says, make hay while the sun shines. I took heed of his advice and kept my serving job. As the year went on, I started seeing more success in the audition rooms. After Taco Bell, I then went on to book a JCPenney commercial as well as a PetSmart commercial. With an overhead of $1,500 a month, zero debt, and a growing savings account, I knew it was time to pivot and quit serving. If I stayed within my budget, I would have two years worth of survival money and I could focus solely on auditioning. In late 2010, I booked a recurring role on 90210 and experienced another first. I made a splash in the media. My first write-up by Perez Hilton was surreal. I even had calls from publicists who wanted to represent me. As the months passed, my manager encouraged me to get a publicist to help build my brand. The publicist would get me into events and on red carpets, and in turn, we could use those photos and the press to help pitch me for other roles. The only catch? Publicists cost $1,500 to $3,000 per month. I respectfully declined that idea. After all, a kid from Ashtabula wasn't about to spend that kind of money. I didn't understand at the time just how important it was to invest money to make money. I shared my thoughts and fears with my manager and he convinced me it would be worthwhile to at least take a meeting with a business manager to help with my finances. I figured it couldn't hurt to get a second opinion, and on top of that, I was making money and didn't know what to do with it. My manager introduced me to a lovely couple named Linda and Alan. They had an office nestled close to the beach in Santa Monica. When we met, they took me out to lunch at a five-star restaurant. I couldn't believe it when they picked up the tab. During our lunch meeting, Linda explained that she would handle everything financially and I could focus solely on my creative. Every ounce of my energy could go towards building my craft and auditioning. Linda would handle the rest. 
That includes paying taxes, cutting checks, paying my bills, and having all mail sent to her office. I left the meeting feeling on top of the world. I had someone who could help me grow my savings and invest appropriately. I felt as if I was finally becoming a real actor. I was building a great team. My manager, theatrical agent, commercial agent, and business manager. It was time to reach the heights of which I had always dreamed. Around March 2011, 90210 came to an end and I auditioned for Days of Our Lives. Three weeks later, I booked the role of Sonny Kiriakis. Talk about a tremendous 12-month run. The young kid from a small town with big ambitions was finally living his dream and everything was falling into place. For the next three years, I worked on the show and saved the money I made. I am grateful to this day for steady employment with Days of Our Lives. The only challenge with being a contract player on a soap opera is lining up other projects correctly to shoot them. During my first few years at Days, I was still auditioning and trying to book guest spots or movie roles, thinking I could film them during my hiatus weeks from the show. I soon realized that it was nearly impossible to do both, so I focused all of my energy on Days, knowing I could eventually go back to auditioning if I wanted to. Discovering Our Passion Project In 2013, my 17-year-old hustle appeared yet again. I had 20 weeks of hiatus off a year and wanted to find a passion project. I wrote and shot a web series called Addicts Anonymous with a few buddies, along with other random projects, but nothing brought us an income that year. Funny how timing lines up. In early 2014, Alyssa came home more excited than I had seen her in a long time. She told me about an acquaintance from Facebook who was making six figures working from home. At this point, she was ringing in her sixth year as an executive assistant and was looking to start a new chapter in her life. Alyssa's long, excited declaration piqued my interest. I asked the magic question, well, what's the gig? She responded with, selling anti-aging cream. My expression went blank. Anti-aging cream, I asked. What do we know about anti-aging? I'll fully support you in your decision, but I don't think it's for me. About a week later, Alyssa asked me if I would like to meet her friend Seth in person for coffee. I wasn't that enthused, but I wanted to support her, so I agreed. Sunday afternoon rolled around, and we met at the Coffee Bean off of Laurel Canyon in Ventura. I instantly loved Seth's energy, and we started chatting. About an hour into the conversation, I looked up at Alyssa and said, I really think we can do this. The most appealing factor for me was that we didn't have to provide inventory as customers purchased everything online. People bought anti-aging products every day. Maybe they would buy from us. I had no idea this meeting would launch us into a whole new world. Yes, we learned about anti-aging products. But more importantly, we learned about ourselves. We learned about business, how to communicate, how to sell, how to interact, and the holy grail, personal development. Other than having heard some people making jokes about self-help books, I'd never known they existed. Successful people wrote books about how they succeeded? My mind was blown. I'd always been interested in learning and growing, but this was the guidance I needed. The kicker? The whole synergy of the company was based around helping others achieve success. That has stuck with Alyssa and me to this day, and we are so grateful. Partnering with the anti-aging company was the perfect marriage of being able to earn and grow in another realm all while I worked on the show I loved. Alyssa and I went all in, and in just a few short months, Alyssa was able to quit her job as an executive assistant and fully support herself with the earnings she made from selling these products. It was amazing. She was around a lot more, and we loved it. She had the flexibility to join me at more events, and we often traveled together. We were truly living our dream, and the sky was the limit. In October of 2014, our business was flourishing, 
and we were going to take a break for a few days and attend the wedding of one of my best friends. He'd asked me to be his best man. I had never done that before. We hopped on a plane to Ohio and were ready to celebrate love and spend time with the family. Life couldn't have been better. I had a successful career, a booming business, a beautiful girlfriend, and healthy friends and family. As a young guy from Ashtabula, I was feeling very confident. So much so, I almost felt invincible. But this trip back to my hometown would change everything. A trip gone wrong. On Monday, October 6th, we got together with some friends in Ashtabula. Everyone was ready to celebrate. The evening included music, games, and vodka. We were exhausted from the day, and as the night wound down, we announced that we were heading home. Our friend Chris pulled us aside and asked, Are you okay to drive? I replied with, Yes, we'll be fine. It's only ten minutes away. Alyssa and I said our goodbyes and hopped into the car, heading home to my parents' house. When we got into the car, we immediately blasted the heat as it was freezing outside and still damp from the rain. A few minutes later, Alyssa fell asleep in the passenger seat and I turned up the music as I drove down the familiar roads where I had grown up. About a mile from home, I made a right onto a street called Route 84. As I made the turn, I lost control of the vehicle and swerved off the wet road, hitting a ditch and flying about 50 feet into the air. As we landed, the front of the car nosedived directly into the ground and then tipped over onto the roof, leaving both of us hanging upside down. Once I came to, I unhooked my seatbelt and dropped onto the roof of the car. I crawled out through the broken glass and felt the rain beating down on my face as blood dripped down my forehead. I immediately called out for Alyssa. Babe? Baby? Can you hear me? There was no response. I continued shouting to her. Alyssa, you're going to be okay. I'm right here. Babe? Baby? It was eerily silent. Just then, I heard her beginning to groan. Baby? I yelled as she sighed again. My heart dropped. I looked up and thanked my lucky stars. She was alive. I ran around to Alyssa's side, trying desperately to get her out. But the car was too smashed. I pulled out my phone and shakily dialed 911 as rain and blood splashed onto the screen. Help was on its way. For the next 15 minutes, I laid on the wet grass next to Alyssa, holding her hand and talking to her as it continued to rain. Once help arrived, they cut the car open to get her out. She was then life flighted to a hospital an hour away, and they sent me to the local hospital for tests. As I came out of shock, I found out my back was cracked, and I was in significant pain. I tried calling numerous times to get a status on Alyssa, but they couldn't give me any information because we weren't technically family yet. On top of not being able to get information on her well-being, I had to wait for a subpoena from the judge to draw my blood to test for alcohol. At this point, the last thing I cared about was a DUI. I needed to get to Alyssa. After a couple of hours, they released me, and we drove an hour to the St. Elizabeth Youngstown Hospital. The moment we parked, I dashed to the front desk as fast as my broken back would allow me. I asked what room Alyssa Tabbitt was in, and we raced to find her. When we entered the room, I pulled back the curtain and saw my beautiful fiancé lying there with a neck brace and eye patch. The nurse informed me she had broken her eye socket, cheekbone, two vertebrae, her left hip, left wrist, ribs, nose, and right ankle. I specifically remember the nurse telling me, even though she looked horrible, luckily there was no organ damage. We left the room as Alyssa was getting prepped for surgery. Her first surgery was to fix her ankle, hip, and wrist. 
since she was already going to be under, they were going to do all of the operations at the same time. We somberly walked out of the waiting room, and I had to make one of the toughest phone calls of my life to Alyssa's parents. Back in 2014, I had spent maybe a total of seven days with Rick and Val, and we didn't know each other very well. I picked up the phone and anxiously dialed Rick's number. Her parents had been in Hawaii on a family vacation, and here I was calling to tell them their daughter had been in a car accident and was about to get multiple surgeries. They dropped everything and caught the next flight to Cleveland. The next morning, I woke up in a hotel bed, unable to move my body. The pain in my broken back was unbearable. My dad came over and lifted me out of the bed so I could use the restroom. I was in so much pain, I couldn't even leave the hotel to check on Alyssa. Instead, my parents and cousin Cherie went over to the hospital to see how she was doing. When they left the room, I was lying in the hotel bed alone and thought this would be the best time to call days of our lives and let them know what had happened. Would I even have a job after this? I was terrified. When would I be able to go back to work? The doctor told me I wouldn't be able to fly for at least six weeks. I knew that wouldn't work with our intense shooting schedule, so I was nervous about bringing it up. The people at Days were hugely compassionate and supportive. The show just wanted to make sure I was okay, and that meant a lot to me. Once we wrapped up the phone call, they ended it by saying they could push all of my episodes for three weeks and asked if that would be enough time. Though it was half the time the doctor recommended, I blurted out, yes, I'll be there. Lawyer up. The next call I had to make was to a lawyer. I got a recommendation from my uncle, who was an ex-state highway patrolman. He passed along the lawyer's number, and I took a deep breath and made the call. After 10 seconds of my explaining what had happened, the lawyer jumped in and a matter-of-factly asked, How badly was she injured? I replied, Well, um, she broke many bones and is having multiple surgeries. There was a small pause on his end, and my heart raced. He then broke startling news. Freddie, in the state of Ohio, if you injure someone to that extent while driving under the influence of alcohol, the state will charge you with agitated vehicular assault, which is a felony three. This charge comes with a minimum of one year in prison. My heart sank. Prison? I asked, frightened. I know I made a mistake, but it was an accident. Bill, the lawyer, explained. Unfortunately, that doesn't matter. What was your blood alcohol content? I took a deep breath and replied, I don't know yet. They took it at the hospital and were waiting to hear back. He responded, if the results come back over 0 0.08, which is the legal limit, you are looking at prison time. Until we receive the results, there isn't much we can do. I hung up the phone in complete and utter shock. The love of my life was in the hospital. I had a broken back and I could be facing prison time. It felt like a nightmare from which I desperately wanted to wake. Later that day, my parents came back to the hotel and shared some uplifting news. Alyssa's first three surgeries were a success and her family had arrived safely in Ohio. This made my heart happy and I was grateful. However, I broke the news I had learned from my lawyer to my family and we all shared a solemn moment together. A few weeks later, my back was on the mend. I'd figured out a way to get out of bed on my own and was able to walk. Bending was out of the question, but I had to get back to my job in LA. The timing couldn't have been worse as Alyssa was about to go into her first eye surgery. After the doctors evaluated Alyssa, they discovered that during the accident, something had hit her in the eye and cheekbone, which disintegrated her eye socket. The bone structure that held her eye in place was gone. The surgeon rebuilt her cheekbone with metal and put a plate under her eye 
to keep it in place. This surgery was intense, and it killed me that I couldn't be there with her. Unfortunately, I had to get back to work. I worked for one week, 11 episodes in five days, and then the following week, the show went on hiatus. This schedule allowed me to return to Ohio. The minute I landed, I rushed to the hospital to see Alyssa and give her a big kiss. I had missed her more than she could ever know. When I arrived at the hospital, I excitedly made my way upstairs. However, once I got to Alyssa's bedside and tried to kiss her, I found I was unable to bend far enough down because of my injuries, and she was unable to turn or sit up, so we physically couldn't kiss each other. We eventually rose her bed as high as possible so we could just barely give each other a peck. But on this specific day, I just sat down next to her and held her hand in mine. This was the first time in a month she was coherent and I felt the presence of our love. I wanted to soak in this moment forever. After our special reunion, the doctor came in and we received bad news. Alyssa's eye surgery had been a failure. The reconstruction of her cheekbone was a success, but the plate that was supposed to act as the floor to her eye socket was too small. This problem caused her eye to sink in. The doctor wanted to go back in and replace it with a larger plate. Although this was not the news we wanted to hear, we stayed positive and scheduled the surgery for early December. After a few days had passed, Alyssa started her rehabilitation. I walked into the rehab room and found her joyfully hanging out with a bunch of therapy dogs. To see her genuine sparkle and smile was priceless. At this same moment, my phone rang. I glanced down and saw it was my lawyer. This was it. I was about to find out my fate. I quickly stepped out and answered the phone. I could tell immediately by the lawyer's tone that it wasn't good news. Bill said, the results came back and they're not good. Your BAC came back at .093. These results meant I was immediately charged with a DUI and agitated vehicular assault felony three. The next day, the news was plastered all over the front covers of local outlets. A few years ago, the small town papers had big spreads saying, small town boy makes it big in Hollywood. And now those same newspapers had covers saying, Soap star crashes car that seriously injured his girlfriend. I was humiliated. I was embarrassed. But the media was the least of my worries. I had to be strong and positive for Alyssa. Her recovery was number one to me. On the following day, my lawyer came over to my parents' house and we discussed my options. If I were to be sentenced to the minimum of one year in prison, I would probably be granted early release after 90 days due to it being my first offense and the person injured not pressing charges. I remember thinking, at least it wasn't a year. But man, the thought of prison was terrifying. On top of that, I was sure I would lose my job. Be that as it may, I couldn't get lost in those thoughts. My focus was on Alyssa. My court date wasn't for three months, so I was grateful I had the time to be by Alyssa's side and help her get healthy before being sent away. Over the next few weeks, we had a very busy schedule. I flew to LA for work and then would immediately turn around and head to Ohio to help Alyssa regain her strength and mobility. I was laser focused on her recovery we were making progress, and as November rolled around, Alyssa finally got clearance to leave the hospital. From there, she was driven to New Jersey, where we spent Thanksgiving with her family, and she started the healing process. During this time, Alyssa got stronger and stronger every day. She still wasn't able to bear weight on her foot, so she wasn't walking just yet but we knew she would be soon. Her spirit was bright, and we knew we were on the right path. When we were in New Jersey for Thanksgiving, I got a phone call 
that changed everything. My lawyer had been talking with the prosecutor of my case, and after looking over the details, he suggested a guilty plea. Since this was my first offense, and the victim, Alyssa, wasn't pressing charges, I could plead guilty and get the charge reduced from agitated vehicular assault, felony 3, to vehicular assault, felony 4. This meant I went from facing a mandatory minimum of one year's jail time to the possibility of either jail time or two years probation. The only catch to the deal was the prosecutor needed to speak with Alyssa directly. Alyssa eagerly hopped on the phone and shared the details of our story and assured them of our meaningful relationship. The prosecutor granted the deal and we were ecstatic. We weren't out of the woods just yet, but even the smallest grain of hope that I wouldn't face jail time was a win. As Thanksgiving approached, things were looking up. Between the news we'd received from the lawyer and Alyssa's overall progress, the holiday became a very special memory. Spending that quality time with Alyssa's family and getting to genuinely know one another was important to me. Connecting on a deeper level and letting Rick, Valerie, and her sister Bree know just how deeply sorry I was for what had happened was healing for all of us. I was here to forever protect and guard Alyssa, and I needed them to know that. The tragic incident brought us many ups and downs, but the most significant silver lining was how close together we all became. Go with your gut. After a few weeks of Alyssa healing in Long Branch, New Jersey, it was time to head back to Youngstown for her second eye surgery. She underwent a very intense seven-hour surgery and recovered for a week in the hospital. Once she had enough energy to begin rehabilitation again, they set her up on a schedule and continued to keep her in the hospital. Unfortunately, after a week, the doctor was not satisfied with the results. Alyssa was unable to move her eye, so the doctor set up an appointment with a specialist. The specialist advised taking the plate out and allowing Alyssa's eye to heal for six months. With no plate holding her eye up, Alyssa's eye would sink in toward her nose. This news was very unsettling. Call it a gut feeling, but none of us felt right about this decision. We discussed the matter with family, weighing pros and cons, and decided not to move forward. Alyssa was anxious to get back home to Los Angeles. Once we got her situated, we would get a second opinion there. A few days before Christmas Eve, Alyssa arrived home, greeted by me, her close friends, and our dog Benji at the airport. She was so happy to be home. A few days later, on Christmas Eve morning, we met with a world-renowned eye muscle surgeon. He examined her eye and informed us that he didn't believe it would be a good idea to remove the larger plate because removing the plate could cause more damage. He felt the eye wasn't moving due to swelling. The doctor wanted to go in and tighten specific eye muscles and loosen others to decrease the amount of double vision Alyssa was experiencing. While we realized Alyssa probably wouldn't get full function of her eye back, the promise of leading a life without double frontal vision would be a win. After a very intense three months, Alyssa and I were grateful to be together in Los Angeles for the upcoming holiday. I asked Alyssa, if you could have anything for Christmas dinner, what would it be? She responded with, burgers, Carl's Jr. cheeseburgers. So that's what we did. We drove over to Carl's Jr., ordered a ton of food, and sat there enjoying one another, laughing over Dr. Pepper's and our Christmas burgers. The Hearing A month later, we returned to the ophthalmologist and received excellent news. Alyssa was ready for surgery. This surgery was a small win and the first step to getting her single vision back. 
the doctor brought her eye down ever so slightly to make both eyes more even. The ophthalmologist said it would take months for the eye to come down and settle fully. In the meantime, he measured a prism for Alyssa to stick on her glasses for single vision. A few weeks after Alyssa's surgery, I was scheduled to visit Ohio. My fate was about to be revealed. Alyssa was still recovering, so I flew to Cleveland on my own and anxiously awaited my sentence. What meant the world to me was that Alyssa's mom, Valerie, flew in and met me in Ohio. Not only was she there to be a solid support system, along with my family, but she also planned to go before the judge and speak on behalf of the Tabbitt family, especially Alyssa, sharing that they stood behind me 100%. As the morning of the hearing approached, nerves washed over me. My lawyer Bill and I took our seats before the judge, as my family and Val took seats in the audience. After all of the details of the case were laid out, Val went before the judge to testify. Your Honor, sending Freddy away would totally destroy Alyssa. Freddy is such a good young man. He's never been in trouble. He made a huge mistake. He has learned a major life lesson. My daughter loves him so much. I love him so much. We bear no resentment or animosity toward him whatsoever. I want us all to be able to move forward without any more trauma and just get on with our lives. The judge took in all the information and proceeded with the sentencing. The verdict? Two years of probation, community service, which was speaking to local high schools about the dangers of drinking and driving, a 72-hour weekend stay at Alcoholics Anonymous, fines, and an online driving course. We were so grateful leaving the courthouse that day. The ordeal had been traumatic for every person involved, but with Alyssa's health on the rise and this significant weight lifted from my shoulders, it was the first time I was able to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Filling my obligations to the court was a priority. I quickly paid some of my fine, scheduled to speak at local high schools in Ohio, and completed the 72-hour alcohol class. The biggest obligation I had to fulfill was the two-year probation period. The rules were as follows. Number one, don't break the law. Doing so would be an immediate violation sending myself to prison. Number two, you cannot leave Los Angeles County without permission from your parole officer. Number three, drugs and alcohol are prohibited. Number four, check in once a month with parole officer and undergo random drug and alcohol tests. The system they had set up in LA was a recorded message which I would call into every evening after 6 p.m., including weekends and holidays. If the recording called my group name, I had to report the next morning between 6 and 8 a.m. to undergo a urine test. My assigned group was called the Pacers. My parole officer, Officer James, also could drop by my apartment at any time to test me or search our place. Officer James was a great guy, and we ended up building a strong bond. He treated me with respect, which I appreciated. As Alyssa and I rode this eight-month roller coaster together, we made a pact. We would always have each other's back and never make excuses for our situation. Excuses are what holds a person back, and we had no room to spare. We had to get our lives back. The definition of excuse by Google is a reason or explanation put forward to defend or justify a fault or offense. Let that sink in. We are all guilty of making excuses, but when we are intentional about showing up in life, 
and not making excuses as to why we can't do something, results will follow. How unfair would it have been for me to go to work unprepared, not knowing my lines, and when asked why I wasn't prepared, hide behind the excuse of, my girlfriend's in the hospital, I'm on probation, cut me some slack. The crew at Days of Our Lives is filled with a team of hundreds of individuals, including camera operators, directors, producers, writers, wardrobe, hair, makeup, actors, etc. To sulk over my problems and not show up for the cast and crew would have been unacceptable. Have you ever heard the saying, you never know what your neighbor's going through? It would have been irresponsible of me not to realize the perspective that people around me at my workplace or in my friend circle could be going through a tough time as well. Someone may be going through a divorce, an illness in the family, the loss of a loved one, or financial troubles. We can't act like the world revolves around us. To be naive and think we're the only ones having a tough day, week, or year. Excuses stop you from living the life you want. When you make excuses, you're giving up before you've begun and you're wasting time by not even trying. Instead of finding reasons to why you can't pursue a goal, spend that time creating a plan to achieve your dream. Don't be the person who says, I can't because of my background. I'm too old to start. I don't live in the right area. I can't do it until blank. This is just how I am. I can't pay off my debt. I'm not ready. Pivot into action. Let's start improving your life right now. Don't wait until tomorrow. Please don't give us that excuse. To overcome your excuses, you must first admit that you're making them in the first place. Scary, we know. Ask yourself. Number one. What excuses do I tend to make? Number two. What am I settling for? Why am I making these specific excuses? Number three. How do these excuses prevent me from moving forward? Number four. What can I do today to stop making these excuses.